Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series. I'm Emily Bierman. Welcome. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind you, as always, to turn off any cell phones or other noise-making devices you may have on your person so you don't disturb those around you during the program. Thank you. The Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series is underwritten by the Norman and Elaine Polsky Family Supporting Foundation within the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation in partnership with Johnson County Community College. The set of topics in these seminars is not being presented anywhere else where successful local professionals share their knowledge to benefit you. Norman Elaine Polsky's name graces this series as well as this wonderful Polsky Theater, and we'd like to thank them for their generosity, which also uh, brings all of us together tonight. Norman Elaine support organizations all over Kansas City and all over the world, so I'd like to acknowledge Norman Polsky and his family members that are here with us this evening and say thank you again for your generosity. Uh, also, thank you to the Carlson Center crews and to our JCCC TV crews that are here with us this evening. We are taping tonight's seminar for broadcast, and if you've not watched us on cable before, you can find us on Time Warner or Sure West Channel 17 and Comcast Channel 22. And if you would rather watch us online, you can go to video.jccc.edu and watch 24 hours a day. So we hope you'll do that soon. Now this is the portion of the program where I normally take you through the packet, and I have to say I'm feeling a bit at a loss because we don't have a packet tonight. Don't you guys miss the packet? I miss the packet. Um, but tonight's packet actually is being sold in the lobby tonight. Our speaker this evening is Adam Bold, and Adam has written uh, The Bold Truth About Investing, Ten Commandments for Your Personal Wealth, for Growing Your, pers your Personal Wealth. Now this is a new edition published in 2009, so since the crash, as Norm likes to say. Um, so how many of you already own this book or have, have read the book? Just a few of you. So you know what that means for the rest of you. You're going to have to buy the book. Now, the books are $10. They're in the lobby. They normally retail for $16 in the bookstore, so we've made a special arrangement with Adam Bold to sell the books at a reduced cost. So we hope you'll take advantage of this. Buy one for yourself, for your children, for your grandchildren. Um, and Norm wanted me to, to say, encourage them to learn to manage their finances themselves so they won't be a burden on you to do it for them. Norm feels very strongly about this book. In fact, he'll have a few words about it after tonight's program. It really correlates to his own investing philosophy. And he wants to tell you that he would have written this book if Adam, Adam hadn't beaten him to it. So we hope you'll take one home tonight. Remember, we're no longer issuing tickets for the Polsky series. There are no reservations. You just come as you can. We hope that when you do attend, you'll bring a friend and spread the word about what we're doing here. Um, and because we no longer have tickets, we do still have our green cards. If you don't receive our mailings or our email blasts, we'd love to add you to the list. So please write that information on the green card, hand it to an usher before you leave this evening. And if you'd like to kind of give us a few ratings on how we're doing tonight and how we could improve, we'd love to hear that from you. If you have a topic to suggest, we'd love for you to write that on the card as well. So please do that and hand it to an usher before you leave this evening. We also have a blue card that you were handed as you came in. This is for questions for our speaker. So if you'd like to ask a question of Adam Bold, please write it on the blue card. You can hand it to me as I walk around the theater to one of the ushers. And at the end of the program, we'll use these cards and go through them with Adam Bold so he can answer the, the questions you have about the program tonight. Now let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Adam opened the first mutual fund store location in July 1996, and since then, his vision has fueled the development of a nationwide system of investment advisory firms, which now includes more than 65 locations. Mutual fund store advisors collectively managed more than $5 billion in assets for more than 28,500 clients as of March 31st of this year. 
In 2008 and 9, the mutual fund store ranked number one in total client relationships in wealth manager surveys of U.S. financial advisors not registered as broker dealers, banks, or trusts. And since 1998, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the mutual fund show. Adam has been the host of this show, a nationally syndicated one-hour radio program airing weekly in nearly 60 markets, including on 980 AM KMBZ here in Kansas City. So I'd like to introduce to you right now Adam Bold, author of The Bold Truth About Investing. Adam. Thank you, Ms. Emily. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for, for coming out. Um, so I was listening to, to Emily um, introduce me. Um, th they do record this, and, and they show it on television. And it's all I can say is that if you have nothing better to watch on television than me, uh, with 97,000 channels I get on Time Warner, um, please, uh, th there's got watch Law & Order or something. I don't, I, I, I don't know. Um, thank you so much for coming out this evening. Wow. Um, it's truly my pleasure to be here. Um, as always, uh, first I want to uh, thank Norm and Elaine Polsky for um, inviting me to come, come speak this evening. Um, Norm is, uh, you know, now he's trying to like take credit for my book too. He's like, yeah, I would have written it. Yeah, okay. Uh, but Norm, uh, for any of you who, who have, have met or, or know Norm, uh, they literally uh, broke the mold when, when they made him. He's a, he's a terrific uh, human being, and um, it, it's been really, uh, he's been a mentor to me and um, really been uh, a, a joy in my life to, to get to, to know him. Um, as is my tradition, I'd like to start with a little humorous anecdote. I was going to call it a joke, but that sets a very high bar. It, it might not be that funny, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to quite call it a joke. Don't want to set the expectations too high. Um, there was a teacher, new teacher. She's talking to her class, and she wants to get to know the kids. She wants to get to know their names and, and who they are. So she said, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to go around the room, and uh, what I'd like you to do is tell me your name and what your, your father does. So the there's a little girl sitting there, and she says, my name is Leslie, and my dad is a mailman. She goes, the second boy, he goes, my name is Andy, and my dad is a policeman. She goes, this third boy, he says, my name is Johnny, and my dad is a drug dealer. <laughs> and that's exactly what she said. The teacher gasped. <gasps> she didn't know what to do, so she, okay, we're done. So... Time goes by, they go out to the playground for recess, she pulls little Johnny aside and she said, Johnny, is your dad really a drug dealer? And he goes, no, my dad is a stockbroker, but I'm embarrassed to tell people that. So. <laughs> All right, let me, um, uh, uh, actually, I was going to go, uh, that, that was uh, actually choice A. Choice B was, how many stockbrokers does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, the answer is two. One to unscrew and drop the bulb. The other one to sell it before it hits the ground and crashes. Uh, so let us uh, talk about our agenda for this evening. I just want to be sure this is working properly. Um, here is my agenda for this evening. Uh, we're going to talk first about the markets. How did we get here? The current economic climate love this. Um, it's my new iPad. This is, um, this is the coolest toy. Not ever, um, because I have to say that Hot Wheels may have been the coolest toy ever, but this is the coolest toy that I've gotten in a really long time. Um, current economic climate, we're going to talk about uh, how to invest now. Life stage investing. And um, there's some things, um, and, and I, by the way, I'd like to introduce Stacy Schreff. This, this is Dr. Stacy Schreff here. Uh, Stacy is my director of investment strategy. Um, and the reason I, I call her doctor is because she went to all the trouble of getting a PhD in economics. Uh, Stacy was with the Federal Reserve for 20 years before she came to work with me. And um, she, um, the, she's done incredible 
uh, work, and, and a lot of what you're going to see tonight is, is, is due to her efforts, and I want to thank her for that. Um, and we have learned some really, really amazing things about um, investing at different stages of life, and I'll, I'll share that with you. So let's talk about how we got here. Um, right now, there's a lot of things to be worried about. Uh, the level of worry in this country right now seems like it's as high as we've ever seen it before. Oh my goodness. I am so worried. He's worried. She's worried. They're worried. All this stuff to worry about. And what are we, wor- what are we worried about? Well, we are worried about the monster deficit, right? The government's spending all this money. We're going to have a huge deficit. We are worried about the fact that the economy is changing and it's a new economy and the Chinese are taking it over and we're not manufacturing anything and the world is different. Um, Hey, are we in a socialist world now? Do we have a socialist president? The government is, is, is taking over these businesses and banks and car manufacturers and clearly can capitalism survive in a world like that? Here's another thing. Let me ask you this. Are we going broke? Is this country going broke? With all the money that the federal government has been spending, are we going broke? It's an interesting proposition. And clearly, these, all these worries that we have right now are different. It's different than it's ever been before. Well, I'm here to tell you it's not, because this Time Magazine cover about the deficit is from 1984. In 1984, black hole, the black hole of deficit, and guess what? Our country is better, more successful, the stock market is higher, and we are more prosperous than we were in 1984 when they were worried about the deficit. Oh, the new economy, 1983. Hmm. How about this one? Can capitalism survive? July 14, 1975. The Ford administration. Um, And this one, is the U.S. going broke? March 13, 1972. So when you hear people tell you, this time is different, oh, these worries that we have right now are different than anything that we have ever faced before in the history of this country. Don't believe the hype. I'm here to tell you tonight that we've had these worries before. Okay, it seems more intense because, as it turns out, we live in the present tense. Okay? Now, we live in a world where we have Fox News, and we have CNN, and we have CNBC, and we have Beck, and we have all these, there's all this content that's out there that we didn't have in previous times. And so it's easy to get caught up in this. But I'm telling you, it is really really not different. Now, one of the things that has happened to people in today's world is that with um, investing, people, it's really easy to get caught up in these headlines, in what's going on right now. In, um, and, you know, CNBC, God love them, I do. Um, I have the unique and, and wonderful privilege of getting to go on CNBC on a regular and recurring basis and that's been a good thing because it allows me to spread the gospel of Adam into to a national audience okay but these people they have they have to fill 14 hours a day worth of programming 14 hours a day oh and by the way um, I was in New York uh, what a month ago a month and a half ago we had um, dinner with a woman who's a producer at one of the financial networks. And she said, you guys, we love it when the market's really volatile. In fact, we can see our ratings are directly correlated to the volatility of the market. And that's what they want. They want this volatility. And they want, they, they, when you've got 14 hours a day, you gotta talk about something, right? Okay, now, besides me and, and these people who work with me, Uh, How many people in this room watch CNBC for 14 hours a day? Oh, I'm not talking about ever. 14 hours a day. No, okay? It's just us. Now, but here's the thing, is that during that 14 hours, you might watch a half hour here, 
15 minutes here. And if you happen to get the one guy who's on at that moment in time who has some scary theory about what's going on in the world, um, it's very easy to emotionally get wrapped up in, in those fears. So what we do instead, we have a different philosophy, and that is I am not going to get caught up in those emotional fears or the day-to-day -day news. Rather, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the data. And that is there is hard and fast data out there that gives us a good idea of what is really going on in the world, what is really going on in the economy. And I'm going to talk about some of that right now. Well, here's one of the things, the question a year ago today, the most common question I got to the radio show from all over the country was that people would say, Adam, the federal government is spending all this money, ridiculous amounts of money, and that is going to re uh, that's going to result in hyperinflation. You guys have heard that, right? Oh, we're, the government's spending money, and that means there, there is like a quid pro quo. Government's spending money, we're going to have inflation. I said, I don't see it. Well, let's take a look at the inflation rate. There are two lines on this chart. Uh, the blue line is the total CPI, what are they, uh, overall CPI. The yellow line is the core CPI, and that takes out food and energy. And it's not, we, we believe that that is a better measure of what the real inflation rate is. And it's not that we, that all of us in this room don't have to buy food or don't buy gasoline or other energy products. It's that the price of oil goes up, the price of oil goes down. It's much more volatile than the price of all the other goods and services. And what you see is that over this period of time, which goes back to January of 07, um, the rate of inflation has been very low. And, we're see and the reason that inflation is not a problem right now is nobody has any pricing power. Um, I can tell you that if uh, you wanted to buy a, an LCD television, a flat panel television, two years ago, you would have paid three to $5,000 for that TV. You can now buy those TVs for $400 to $1,000. Okay, if you buy a TV, uh, uh, today, this very day, um, I went and I bought a car because my twins are turning 16 and went and bought them a car. I went in there and I did my homework. And I, I knew what the sticker price of the car was, and I knew what the dealer's cost of the car was, because that information is readily available on the internet. And I went to the dealer and I said, here's the deal. I want to buy this car. I'll pay you $100 over invoice for it. And they went, he went back and let me check with my boss. Goes back there, came back. Five minutes later, he goes, we have a deal. Boom, done. Okay, if you buy a car, you expect to get a deal on it now. If you buy clothes, you expect to get a deal on it. Nobody has price. Nobody can raise. Everybody wants to raise prices, but they can't because in this, everybody knows we're kind of in a shaky, weak economy. We're recovering from a recession, and people are not willing to pay more. So there's no inflation. Those of you who are drawing Social Security, um, how much of a raise did you get for inflation this year? Zero. Okay. Do you know why? Because there's no inflation. I'm sorry, it's not happening. Um, there, are many who would who, there are many who would like you to believe that the economy is terrible, is continuing to be terrible, and th there's no sign that this economy is getting any better. Well, let me show you something. The manufacturing sector. Um, this is a chart that shows the ISM index and that, that what, what the uh, acronym ISM is not important. What this is, is this is an, um, an index that follows manufacturing activity in the United States. And the black line that is in the middle of uh, this chart is uh, 50. And anything above 50 shows growth in manufacturing. And what you see is that since August of 2009, manufacturing activity has picked up. For, for when we were in the, the dark ages, uh, that was the uh, fourth quarter of 08, first quarter of 09, um, nobody was making anything. People were, companies were trying to reduce inventories. They were doing whatever, I'm not making anything. I, I can't sell anything. I'm not going to make anything. We're going to lay people off. Well, guess what? Um, it's coming back. How about uh, the consumer is dead. The consumer, people have too much debt. They can't buy anything. 
Done. No, what you see is that since about that same time, August of February of 2009 actually is one of retail sales. See, people weren't buying stuff. Even people I know who are really, really, uh, who are independently wealthy, who are financially successful. I had people that, well, I'm not going to um, take a vacation this year. And well, why not, man? You're, you're an orthodontist. You can, you know, kids still have crooked teeth, right? And, and they're like, no, well, I heard, you know, the economy's bad. And I, so I'm not going to, everybody kind of went into this, this thing where they weren't, they weren't spending any money. But now, look, in this country, we love to buy stuff. And people get bored, the people got bored of not buying stuff. I mean, now they're, they're getting deals on it. Look, the stuff we buy, we expect to get a deal. But people got bored. And now, as you can see, uh, we have seen retail sales increasing, and that is a very good sign for the economy. Not something you hear every day. You hear things are bad. Okay, so we've got um, inflation is low. We have manufacturing is picking up. We have retail sales are picking up. Corporate profits. Corporate profits are on the rise. And what happened was, when we went through the dark ages, once again, fourth quarter of 08, first quarter of 09, companies slash costs. They cut employees, they um, did whatever they had to do to cut expenses. And now what's happened is the economy's turning back up, and so sales are increasing, sales are increasing, but um, they've got their expenses under control. And as a result, companies are, are the, the companies that made those changes um, are, be, are very, very profitable and growing more so every day. And I contend that this is a natural part of the economic cycle, that every one, I don't like it, but every once in a while, we have to go through this process because companies get fat. It's a lot easier to add overhead than it is to take it away. And every once in a while, like it or not, you need a little reality check and get things back in order. Um, the, I liken it to my annual physical that I have every year. Um, I don't like it. Uh, I'll just tell you, um, there are not many things in life that scare me. Needles are one of them. Um, I had my physical uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, I, call, I, I, had, I thought it was major surgery. They did a blood um, removal surgery on me. Um, <laughs> and I have to lay down. I get these vasovagal reactions where like I pat... Um, I'm going to digress for just a moment. My staff is not going to like this story. But here's what happened. Um, somebody told me I should go get a flu shot. You need to get a flu shot. So the uh, hen house had... the hen house. And so I go there and the lady gives me the shot and I pass out cold on the floor. <laughs> now, this is like right where people walk in, right? So lying on the floor, which by the way, you like uh, um, Fred Ball does a great job of keeping the hen houses clean, <laughs> but not clean enough that you want to lay on it, okay? <laughs> so here I am, I'm, I'm a bit... Um, well, first of all, I'm flushed, I'm a bit embarrassed, and then it turns out that when you pass out on the floor of the hen house, that all your friends and neighbors also shop there, and they're like, hey, that's Adam. <laughs> ah! oh, uh, oh, it's a hoot. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> here's my point. As much as I am afraid of needles, afraid enough, uh, and by the way, I've since decided I would rather have the flu than the shot, um, but um, if but I go and get my physical every year. I don't like it. I really, really, really don't like it. But it's important. Okay? And so sometimes businesses have to go through this cycle where they don't want to cut expenses, they don't want to cut staff, they don't want to, but sometimes we've got to do it. Jobs. Um, we're going to get a jobs report this coming Friday, which should show um, an addition of somewhere between four and 500,000 jobs. I've seen numbers, 450, 475, 500. Um, but w f during, the, um, during the January 09, I was telling people, look, the employment situation is getting better. And what that meant then 
was that we are losing less jobs. Okay, and that's the first step towards getting better, but now we're actually adding jobs. Companies are hiring. Um, in 2009, at the Mutual Fund Store, I think we hired one, two, something like that. We're back in hiring mode, okay, because, and, and, and we are just a little microcosm of the, the rest of the universe. Companies are starting to hire people. But now, remember when, when uh, these companies were laying off all these people and there would be a head, every night um, one of the newscasters would come on and go, oh, this company's laying off these people. Well, now they're putting people back to work, but it doesn't, they don't make headlines because it's not as cool a story. People losing their jobs, that's a great story. For some reason, we, we love a trauma. We, you know, look, if you watch the evening news at night, if you think about the evening news, how, how is it constructed? Okay, sports comes at the end. Weather comes just before that. What comes first? Murder, mayhem, fire. Okay, there is something in our psyche. We like that. It's like, you know, um, when you're stuck on I-35 and you're in traffic because there's some horrific wreck and everybody's got... Now, I don't mind... I actually don't mind if people rubberneck for a horrific wreck. I don't... I'm not saying, you, you know, you want... But there's something in the macabre that we like. What I hate is when I've been waiting in traffic for a half an hour and then it's like some guy changing his tire. Um, and you guys have all been there. Um, so jobs are increasing. So we got manufacturing's increasing. Um, retail sales are increasing. Uh, jobs are going up. The economic data is very good. Now I realize that when I show you charts and graphs like this and when I tell you that things are getting better, it's not nearly as exciting as uh, the doom and gloom people that are on the radio and on television. I, re I mean, it's not, it's not as good a story. Uh, but this is what we base our investment, when we, when we make investment decisions as to what we're gonna do with our clients, and what I'm gonna recommend to you, and what I talk about on the radio, it's based on the data. Government debt. How many of you have heard that the debt, the US debt, is out of control and terrible and we're gonna have a real problem. How many of you have heard that um, Greece is having some issues with the debt that they have? This is a chart that shows the um, debt of each of these countries as a percentage of the gross domestic product, okay, GDP, which is the total value of all the goods and services sold um, or created in that country. Um, the U.S., you're going you're gonna to see this number, it's at about 83%. And um, that is not quite right. We're really at a number like 53%. And the reason that it says 83 is that 53% uh, is what private, hold, what, what the public holds in debt. The other 30%, roughly, is debt that the Social Security Trust Fund has, that other, the FDIC has. Um, it's basically the government borrowing money from itself. But even if you take these numbers, so we look, we look apples to apples, um, when you look at our debt relative, see, you can say, we can say, yes, you know what, the government, is, this Congress and the last Congress and this president and the last president, they spent more money than I'm used to. And I don't like it and it should change. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. What I can tell you is, at least to now, they have not put us in significant peril, and we do not live in a vacuum. We're not the only, you can say we're spending more than we should, but when you look at us relative to the rest of the world, I mean, Greece, their problem is they're at 120% of GDP. So that would be, like if you had credit card debt that was equal to 120% of your annual income. Now, you wanna get scared? Everybody's scared about Greece. How about our friends in Japan? In Japan, their debt is 220-some percent of GDP. Have you guys heard anything about Japan? Anybody freaked out about Japan? No. Now, here's the difference between Japan and Greece um, and why Greece is a problem and Japan isn't. Um, and that is that in Greece, they don't really have any way to make money. They're, they have tourism, they've got a little bit of you know, olives and shipping, 
And that's all they got. They can't make any more money. They, so it would be sort of like you had all this debt and then you lost your job. Or you had to take a job making half of what you used to make. Japan has debt that, believe me, all this debt is maybe more than what, what we would think is prudent for our own house. Um, but the debt in Japan, the, the difference is, is they make stuff. They make cars. They make computers. They make medical devices. They make um, sushi, which is delicious. Um, <laughs> they make all these things. And, but the reason that nobody's freaking out about Japan is that even though their debt is high, because they have such high income, they, they, they have enough income coming in to be able to make the payments on their debt. Whereas Greece took on all this debt and they don't have enough income to be able to pay, the, pay their debt. But our debt right now, um, as a percentage of GDP, we are not in significant peril. Here's another thing I hear from people they're worried about. Adam, the, here's what's different this time. The markets have gotten really volatile. Oh my gosh, we're down 300 one day and we're up 150 the next day. Um, and that's different than it's ever been before. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that it is not different. Um, and I'm going to just walk over here and I'm going to mosey with my face to the camera over here. Um, this blue line is what is called the VIX. And the VIX is a measure of the volatility of the S&P 500. The yellow line is the historical performance of the S&P 500. And the first thing that I will point out is, you see that big spike on the right side of the chart where the VIX went way up? That was the global financial crisis. That was um, uh, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. And we were on the verge, literally, of a collapse of, of the global financial system. And you guys, I can't tell you how bad that was. People don't, you know, it's, it's sort of like if, um, remember when everybody was worried about the H1N1 and the swine flu and, and all this, well, if you never got swine flu, you don't know whether it was really as bad as they said, because you, you, you never got it. If you got it, which I did, um, and I want to thank my children for that, that was a great gift. Um, <laughs> if you got it, um, then you know how bad it was. Well, we were this close to having a literally a global financial collapse, and it didn't happen. Okay, well, it didn't happen, and so it's hard to appreciate what it would have been, but literally, it would have been like, I mean, how many people, when you go to the bank, you have money in the bank, you get a piece of paper from the bank every month that tells you how much money you have, right? You can go on the internet, and they'll tell you, you get a thing that shows you how much money you have in the bank, right? But you don't, have like money, you have a piece of paper that says you have money. Well, let me ask you a question. If the bank is out of business, it's like you go there and the, the doors are locked, what do you got? You got nothing because you got a piece of paper that says, oh, I have money. Yeah, no, you don't because there's no bank anymore. We were literally, it could have gotten that bad. Well, we avoided it. Um, that's what that spike was. That was abnormally high Volatility. Where we are right now, if you took a line and made the median level of that blue line, it's about where we are now. This volatility is not unusual, um, and, and this is 20 years uh, worth of data, by the way. It, it's, we're at the upper end, maybe, of the average range, but it's, it's not out of control. And here's the other thing. People go, well, the market's been so volatile, that must mean that the market's going to go down. Well, in this period of time, the... What we saw here is you can see that the volatility was going up, and at the exact same time that the volatility was going up, the market was going up. So in this case, volatility was rising, the market was rising. Then we have this period, and what happened here was volatility went down, volatility went down, and the market still went up. Okay? And then we have this period where the volatility went up and the market went down. What I'm here to tell you is at looking at 20 years worth of data, the last 20 years worth of data, um, what Dr. Stacy and I have determined is there is absolutely no correlation between volatility and direction of the market. Absolutely no correlation. Now, what I can tell you is when there's volatility, it makes people freak out. Um, both good and bad, it makes people more interested, uh, makes more people watch CNBC, 
But there is no, so just because there's this volatility, that does not in any way indicate what the direction of the market is going to be. So all that being said, what do you do? That's great, Adam. Okay, I get it. The economy's getting better. And despite these people who want to, um, as I said on the radio show last week, scare the pants off of you, um, and they've done a good job of doing that, there's a lot of people walking around pantsless um, because the, the, the media has, 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 has scared them. Um, Adam, just for the sake of discussion, Adam, I believe you. The economy is actually getting better, and that's why we are really constructive on this market. Um, I, at the beginning of the year, I said I thought that um, in 2010 the market would be would get to 11,700 or higher, and I stand behind that. We still believe that. We believe that there's there's a lot more uh, good stuff to come. So here's my investing philosophy, and that is number one: you need to make a plan. And you need to stick to it. Um, the, what happens many times to people is they go, yeah, okay, so everything's going along cool and the market's good and, and it's all right. And people go, okay, here's my plan. I made this plan. And then they go, and then they come on television and they say that Greece is going to go bankrupt. And people go, well, I got to sell everything because Greece is going bankrupt. No, if you have the right investment plan to get you from here to there, whether it's I'm in the accumulative stage of my life, and we'll talk about this more in detail later, or it's, um, it's about the, um, you're, in, you're retired and you need your income to whatever. What, at whatever point you are on the investing curve, you put together a plan and you stick to it, and just because you hear news on a daily basis doesn't mean that you should change your plan. You make your plan, and you, that doesn't mean you don't review your plan. You do. It needs monitoring, okay? But it's not the kind of thing where you have to uh, panic and sell things just because you heard some piece of news. Asset allocation is the key to being able to weather a market. Now, asset allocation is one of those terms that we like to use in the investment management business. But all that means is you don't put all your eggs in one basket. So you got some cash, you got some bonds, you got some stocks, you got some little stocks, big stocks, foreign stocks, foreign bonds, a little of this, a little of this. And if you diversify, then gains in one piece of the pie can offset losses in another, and it can, you can weather just about any kind of economic environment. Here's the thing that is really hard um, for people to get. And that is investing takes time, it takes patience. Um, we live in a world where I can uh, get my email on my Blackberry all day and all night long. Uh, we live in a world where I can carry my iPad around and I, I you guys wanna watch TV? I can watch TV on this thing, it's really cool. Um, we can have it right now. Okay. Um, remember, remember way back in the day when if there was a TV show you liked, you actually had to watch it at that time, and you'd like make you make your whole schedule around like, oh, I got to be home so I can watch Happy Days, you know? <laughs> um, no, I mean we don't live in that time. We can have it on demand. The Mutual Fund Show, perhaps the greatest radio show, well, clearly the greatest radio show that I ever made. Um, it's the only radio show I've ever made, but that, that's beside the point. Um, we podcast now. So if you want to listen on Saturday morning, please do. If you want to listen on Wednesday morning, go ahead. You want to, I mean, we live in this world where everybody wants everything now. We have instant messaging. We have Twitter. We have Facebook. We have um, everything moves at such a rapid pace. And so everybody's used to getting everything right now. I want it now. I want it now. I want it now. Unfortunately, investing doesn't work that way. It's one of those things you gotta be patient. And um, being patient means sometimes sitting on your hands even if you wanna do something. Um, lastly, if you need help, get help. Wishing and hoping. That's, that's what a lot of people, uh, I'm gonna buy this and I, w I hope it works out. I'm gonna buy this investment and I am going to um, blow out the candles on my cake, and I'm gonna wish that my investments work out for me. 
Um, that is not a strategy. You know, it's, it's interesting to me as I talk to people. Um, uh, last night I was talking with um, my godmother, and um, she, um, they, they own some nursing homes. And she was saying that, she goes, Adam, it's really terrible. She goes, we have these people, uh, we have particularly women that, are, that, that live in our facility, and they're having to move out and go move in with their kids because when the market went down, they ran out of money. And I said, well, um, that shouldn't happen to them. And if they had the right investment advisor, you know, just because somebody is nice, just because somebody belongs to your church or your rotary club or whatever, and they're friendly, that doesn't mean that they're capable. Um, I'll never forget when my oldest daughter was born. At that time, um, um, my, 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 at that time, my wife was a surgical nurse by profession, and she worked in the OR at St. Luke's Hospital. And she said, when I get ready to have the epidural, any of the doctors, can, any of the anesthesiologists can do it, except for these two guys. And she gave me their names. I had to write them down. Okay. And now those guys were still doctors. They still had the same certificates and everything else that the other guys had. It's just she had seen them see, stick a needle in somebody's back, and she went, didn't want them to do it. Now, I, I will say, at that point in time, I believe she would have let me put the needle in. Um, <laughs> I'm very fond of saying that, um, no, never mind. <laughs> All I'm saying is that childbirth didn't really hurt. That. It made me a little queasy, but it didn't really hurt. Um, <laughs> it's a joke. Seriously, sarcasm, OK? Um, but here's the thing. When my car breaks, I pay somebody to fix the car. Um, if my lawn has spots in it, I pay somebody to come tell me how to fix the spots on my lawn. If I'm sick, I go see somebody who is an expert and can, um, can, can take care of my problems. For some reason, with investing, people are like, I don't want to pay for that. I can do it on my own. And some people can. And I'm not telling you that you can't. I'm just saying, um, Dr. Stacy got a PhD in economics so that she could help me make investment decisions. I spend every waking moment of my life working at this, thinking about this stuff. I have a whole staff that, that this is what we do. It's harder, and if, you're, if, you're, if after all said and done, you're just wishing and hoping, I strongly urge you to get some help. And from somebody, not the nicest guy, not the friendliest guy, not the guy who lives next door to your mom or the best guy. Just like you want the best doctor. Look, if you needed to have brain surgery, you would not pull out the yellow pages and look for the doctor that had the coolest name or the nicest doctor. You want the best brain surgeon, right? Same thing with your mind. Which, I mean, do you think that, um, you know, it may, it's one thing if you let the neighbor kid come over and mow your lawn, okay, and like, eh, you know, he really didn't do that great a job. He didn't edge. Um, but, you know, he's a nice kid. Okay, what's the worst that happens? So your lawn isn't edged. I contend that your money that has to be there for the rest of your life is closer to being as important as brain surgery than it is to what your lawn looks like. Here's another thing. Um, we have seen a tremendous amount of money flowing into bonds. People, we went through the 2000 through 2002 bond market, or a stock market that went down 50% over that period of time. And then like we, 2003, four, five, six, seven, we finally get back to even, and then the market loses 50% of its value in six months. And people are going, well, you know, and, and they look at the last five years average returns, and the returns have been much better on bonds and stocks. So over the trailing 12 months, over the last 12 months, there was about $500 billion that of new money that went into mutual funds, more money that went in than came out. Of that 500 billion, 400 billion of it went into bond funds. Now, people are buying bond funds at the exact moment that interest rates are almost zero. Let's take a look at the last 30 years of interest rates. Okay? For the last 30 years, interest rates have done nothing but go down. Yeah, there have been little blips, but for 30 years, interest rates have been going down. When interest rates go down, 
the value of existing bonds go up. Been fantastic. So if you had bonds, it's pretty much worked out okay. On the other hand, the inverse is that when interest rates go up, the value of existing bonds go down. Now, with interest rates where they are right now, I am going to tell you, they can't go down. I, I don't know what the outcome is. They could stay the same. That could happen. Can't go down. I mean, you have a two-year treasury that's at, what, 75 basis points? Uh, two-year treasuries paying three quarters of 1% a year interest. That's pretty much free, right? No, that's like no interest. They're not going to pay you to, 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 I mean, you're not going to pay them to get a treasury. Okay, so it's almost zero. So I contend that at some point, six months from now, six weeks from now, a year from now, I don't know, interest rates are going to go up. And the value, when interest rates go up, the value of existing bonds go down. And there are a lot of people in this world who don't know that you can lose money in bonds. Even if it's a government, you can lose money in bonds. I'm here to tell you that that is absolutely positively the case. And here's the other thing that I'm going to tell you. The longer the maturity of a bond, the more it will decline in value. So if, you, if interest rates went up 2 or 3%, if you have a bond that is a year or two of maturity, it might go down 5%. If you have a bond that is a 20 or 30 year maturity, or is a preferred stock, or is a Ginny May that has a 30 year maturity, it could lose 50%. You heard me right. You could, two or three percent, two or three percent increase in interest rates could mean that certain bonds will decrease by 50% in value. How many people in this room, how many people that are watching me on the fantastic Johnson County Community College television network, um, know that you could lose 50% in a bond. I don't think there's, a lot of people would be very surprised to hear that. And what's happening is all this money is going into bonds because people invest with whatever, the most recent stimuli, whatever the best thing was for the last period. And so they're jumping into bonds the same way that they did into technology stocks at the end of 1999, same way they did in Chinese. I mean, we, we've seen, they're doing, it's different instruments but people aren't patient. Now, I'm not telling you you shouldn't own bonds. We own bonds for our, in our client portfolios. But what we have done is we have taken the maturities way down. Um, I would tell you that on the whole, the average maturity of average duration of the bonds in our client portfolios is somewhere probably in the three to four year range. And the reason that we did that is that I, there are times when you want to make money from your investments. So right now, we think the stock market looks very, very attractive. And we, we want to take advantage of that for our clients. Um, right now, we think the bond market does not look attractive. And what we, we're not trying to make a bunch of money from bonds right now. What we're trying to do is not lose money for our clients in bonds. And um, people should not be like, even if you normally buy CDs, CDs are paying nothing now, OK? Put it in a money market. Get your next to zero right now. At least you're not losing anything. You're going to have, there's going to come a time six months from now, a year from now, a year and a half from now, when you're going to have an opportunity to lock in rates at much higher rates. So let's, I'm willing to give up some yield in the short term in exchange for not losing principal over the long run. And we'll have much better opportunities. Let's talk about life stage investing real quickly. All right, here's one of the big lessons that I learned and uh, Stacy and I have, have developed theories together um, from the downturn of 2008, 2009, and, and really the, bear, the, the earlier bear market, too. And that is, you go through your life, and there are two parts to your life. The vast majority, in terms of years in your life, you spend accumulating money. Um, this is okay. And, and when you get Money Magazine, or when you, it's all about like, here's how to invest now. And here's what you should invest in. And it's all about what should you invest in to make your money grow and to, um, to, have, to have your money. And from a percentage standpoint, that's the vast majority of your life you spend on, on the asset accumulation. But you get to a point, what's the point of all that? The point is to accumulate a sum of money from which you can create an income stream once you reach retirement. Now, 
When you're young, 20, 30, 46, um, I just ran, I, I picked that number at, at random. Um, um, if you make a mistake with your investments, you have some options that are available to you. You can work longer. You can cut back on your lifestyle so you can save more. You can, uh, you've got a number of things that are available to you. But once you're retired and you have no more source of income, if you make a mistake, you have no way to make up for that mistake. Because you can't replace, you can't replace it. The, the only thing you can do is, is eventually run out of money. Um, so this distribution stage is, is infinitely harder. And once you retire and you have this money, um, there are three things that you need to accomplish with this money. Number one, capital preservation. You need to make sure that what you have will last for the rest of your life. Number two, you need income, money to spend. You retire, that means your paycheck stops, but your bills don't stop. You st even if your house is paid for, you still got to put gas in your car. You still got to put um, you know, food in your mouth. You still got to pay your taxes, your utilities, um, you know, shoes, w w whatever the, 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 the case may be. Um, and so you need money to spend on a monthly basis. And lastly, you need some growth. That's right. Even in retirement, you need growth because what if you can afford to buy these things on a certain amount of money today, 10 years from now, it is going to cost more to buy those very same things. And if you, if you take all your money and you put it in CDs and you only spend the interest, you're going to run out of money because eventually, the, if you don't get the growth, um, you will not be able to maintain that same purchasing power. So income distribution, monthly uh, reliable income to pay monthly expenses. Years to come. Oh, I just said all this stuff. Here's the other thing is people are living longer. You know, it used to be people retire at 60 and die at 68. Um, now people retire and they, you know, I mean, it's not, I'm going um, next month uh, to upstate New York to see my grandmother for her 95th birthday. She's in great shape. I mean, she'll, you know, she's not as physically perfect as I am, but, you know, <laughs> she's 95 years old, right? And, uh, but she's, she's in great shape, great health. I mean, and it is not uncommon for people to live that long. Um, and so, you, you know, there, there are people that we, we hear these anecdotal stories about people and they're like, well, I ran out of money. I just didn't expect, I'm, I didn't expect to live this long. I thought I would have enough. Um, we need to make sure that, that, that it lasts. Inflation can erode your buying power. Here's, what we, here's our primary theory on retirement, investing in retirement. And that is the worst thing that can happen to you once you retire. The very worst thing that can happen is that you have to sell things when the markets are down. Because if you have to sell when prices are low, you get a double whammy. Number one, you're, 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 you're selling at low prices. I mean, clearly the basic rule of investing, buy low, sell high, um, you're violating that because you're selling low. The other thing is that ultimately when the markets bounce back, I mean, if you look at, at the recovery that we've had from the March 2009 lows, um, if you were taking money out the whole time, when the market bounced back, you had less to bounce back because you were having to sell things at those lower prices. Um, what we believe is the most, it, um, we don't want to protect you from, a lot of these annuity guys, they're like, well, if in, um, you buy this thing and if in 10 years it doesn't work out, then we'll make it up to you and then we'll pay it back to you over the next 10 years. So it's a 20 year thing. We contend, it's not important um, what, where you are 10 years from now is not that important. What you need right now is we need to protect you against short-term declines in the market, three to five years at, at the, you know, a full market cycle. That's what you need to be protected against. Um, and you need to maintain a potential. And here's the other thing, is the vast majority of our clients who are successfully retired, they made, they, they didn't uh, win the lottery they didn't um, inherit it. They did it by saving small amounts of money on a recurring basis over extended periods of time. They saved in their 401k. They saved in mutual fund. Well, okay, now you're retired and you need to preserve your capital. But at the same time, 
If you're the kind of person that built your fortune by investing, if the market goes up and you're not participating, it's going to bug you. So, you know, people still want to participate to a certain extent, and, and we can make that happen. Um, the way we did that is we invented what we call the retirement paycheck, and, and this is not a commercial, but, uh, but um, the retirement paycheck, uh, we actually um, have a patent pending on our... Um, uh, on the methodologies and the algorithms and the system that we use in the retirement paycheck service. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about it. But um, I've never had a patent. But I wrote a book. I've been on TV, radio. That was cool. Um, the patent, that'll be, that'll be cool. Um, but we're, and I'm not sure exactly when, but we, th this is really a revolutionary theory. And um, what we do is we take the client's money and we split it into two pieces. Um, the growth component, which is the part that we let participate in the market and to counter inflation and to let you still participate in the market. And then the income protection component, which is the rock solid lockbox. When I say lockbox, I don't mean like the government when they said, you know, we need to have a Social Security lockbox. Yeah, how'd that work out? Not so well. Um, but absolutely safe and secure. That protect and the amount that we have in either the growth part or the safe part, safer part, because um, my compliance officer, he won't, he won't like safe. The safer part um, will depend on what happens with the markets. And essentially, the way it works is, like I said, what we don't want to do is we don't want to sell when things are down. So what we do is we have the blue represents the growth bucket. The golden bucket represents the protected income protection part. And when the markets go up, we take profits from the growth in the stock market, and we, put, we siphon off some of those profits to, to not only replenish, but to maybe add to the income protection part. And when things go up a little bit, we take some of the profits. When things go up a lot, we take a lot of profits. When things are down, when the market is down, we don't replenish. We just use some of that part that we put into the protected bucket. Okay, and so the concept is that when things are going great, see, when things are going great, psychologically, people go, I just want to leave my money. Look, this thing keeps going up. I, I want to. But what we do is we siphon some of the profits so that we can reduce or eliminate the need to sell things when prices are low. And that, over time, and, and by the way, Stacey, we back, te back tested this back 30 some years and um, we've built algorithms. So instead of us just guessing, well, you know, the market seems to be doing pretty well, maybe we should sell a little bit. Instead, we've built algorithms based on um, when the stock market, when the economy is doing this, we replenish this much. When it's doing this, we replenish this much and um, it's uh, work like a charm. Oh, one last thing. It's really, really important. Um, on Saturday mornings, there's this show, <laughs> and, it, and it's on at 10 o'clock on KMBZ here in Kansas City, as well. And by the way, um, you might say, "Well, Adam, I want to listen, but I'm going to be I'm going to Las Vegas for the weekend." Now, that's all right because we're on KXNT in Las Vegas. Um, Adam, we're going to San Francisco. We're going to wine country. That's all right. We're on KSFO in San Francisco, so. Um, you can always go to mutualfundshow.com and see all the stations, so that way you can plan your travel around uh, what time I'm on the radio, because it would, it would really be a shame if, if you were to miss that. All right, with that, I am going to invite Ms. Emily to uh, rejoin me on the stage, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Hey, um, um, in past years, we've had chairs. Do you think we should have chairs, or do you, you want to... What would you like? Well, I, I'm good because I have this, but you don't really have anything. So would you like a I, chair or two? Well, I don't need two chairs. <laughs> well, I'll sit with you. If you'd I, like I mean, to I sit, like, I'll sit too. Um, Let's just do some questions and see how it goes. What do you uh, say? All right, go ahead. I just don't know where I'm supposed to st like, Do I stand behind you? Well, that's my... one way to do it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Emphasizing my shortness. Thank you. Um, uh, it's height challenge. It's not shortness. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that you're welcome. makes me feel better. Okay. Yeah. 
I tried. <laughs> okay, our first question of the night is from our, our great benefactor, Norman. And he says, what do you think of the Matthews, China, or Brazil index funds? Are these two countries going to continue growing faster than any other country, including the U.S.? Okay, so um, first of all, uh, Matthews, China, Steve Matthews, the, the, the manager of that fund, is as good an investor in China as uh, anybody that's out there. Okay. That being said, um, we prefer to not invest in country-specific funds. Um, I will tell you, there is no doubt that the economy in China is going to continue to grow and at a pace that is faster than that of the U.S. What I don't know is I don't know how much of that is already priced in, into the Chinese market. The market has gone up a lot. And now they've recently had a, a, a correction in their market, just as, as we did in ours. Um, so, uh, because I, and I would pose this question, and that is, um, over the next year, will the market in China or the market in Cambodia perform better? I don't know. Will the market in Brazil or the market in Bolivia or Belgium or, give me another one, a B. Uh, Bonaire. I like that place. Um, if, if, I, I don't know. What I can tell you is um, we own a fund uh, for our clients called the Lazard Emerging Markets Fund. The symbol is L-Z-O-E-X. Lima, Zebra, Oscar, Edward, X-Ray. And it has a strong presence. They, they have a significant portion in China. They have a significant portion in Brazil. But what these managers at, at Lazard have been able to do is if Brazil is the place to be, um, they know, they have value, they have ways of analyzing. Um, and one of the problems that you get into when you start doing investing internationally is that not everybody has the same accounting standards. And so you can look at like this Brazilian company and we make this much money and you look at a country, a company from Italy, and they have completely different. You see, and so what these managers do is they they normalize the earnings. So they take they take um, the earnings from these various countries, and they bring them all to U.S. GAAP standards, so that they have a way to compare apples to apples. And um, they know. So if China is the place to be, they're going to be in China. If Brazil is the place to be, they're going to be in Brazil. If it's someplace else, they're going to be there. And those people know a lot better than even I do about whether that's the place to be. And, um, they, and they've shown an ability to not only be in the right countries at the right time, but also to avoid being in the wrong countries at the wrong time. Very good. Here's someone that is responding to what you said about the con consumer price index mm -hmm. remaining pretty constant. Mm -hmm. And although that may be true, a gallon of ice cream is now three quarters of a gallon. So you're paying the same price, but you're really getting less. So is it really accurate to say that prices yeah, have remained the, the, constant? And um, as I said, Stacy used to work for, for, for the Fed, so she could tell you exactly how they compute the CPI. I'm going to do my best. And um, one of two things is going to happen. Either she's going to shake her head at me, meaning, no, you got that wrong, or um, tomorrow morning when I get to work, she's going to tell me, you shouldn't have said that about CPI. Um, <laughs> but here's, here's what I can tell you, is they normalize that. The, the, so even if they sell three quarters of a gallon of ice cream instead of a gallon, mm -hmm. when they make the CPI, it's based on a gallon of ice cream. So they may have to take the price of a three quarter gallon and, take, and then a third of another container, but it's still based on the price of a gallon of ice cream. And so that index is, is accurate because they're, they're constantly um, uh, comparing apples to apples. So inflation is just not, a, it's not an issue. We're, I will tell you, of all the things that we worry about right now, the biggest thing that we are worried about and is uh, our interest rates. I'm worried that interest rates are going to go up. And it's not just that the Fed's going to raise interest rates. It's that the market is going to bring interest rates up. And uh, one of the things that, that we've been looking at um, in terms of the national debt and inflation, because I keep hearing this thing, um, uh, Glenn Beck. Okay, Glenn Beck is a tremendously entertaining guy. And there's a lot of what he says that I agree with. The problem I have with Glenn Beck is when he takes his political views and he tries to translate it 
into financial things, and it, it's fuzzy logic. It, 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 it doesn't get from one place to another in the right way, and I'm, I'm afraid he's going to hurt a lot of people with, with the things he's... Not, not that he's wrong in concept, it's just that when he starts talking about financial things, he's just... And, and, because, and the reason I mention him is because throughout the country, his show is on the same radio station as my show. So a lot of the listeners to my show are people who listen to him. And um, this is one of the things that, that he did. The numbers are, are all cooked and, you know, you can't trust anything. That, and it's just not that way. Inflation is just not a problem. Interest rates will be a problem. I've had a couple of questions here about people who are already retired, they're in their 70s, they've lost money in their portfolios, and they're kind of in the situation that you described where you can't go back to work, yeah. you can't cut costs anymore. What other options do they have? I liked your, your buckets analogy too. Yeah, and what, your well, what the option is, uh, unfortunately, you have what you have. Okay, you know, um, I can tell you that um, I, 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 have, I own two houses in Las Vegas. I wish I only owned one. Because okay. um, the one I have, and the first one that I bought is worth substantially less than what I paid for it. Yeah. The market, you know, I, I, bought, I thought I bought it right, but the market fell more than what I thought. My, my house is worth less than what I paid for it. Um, I wish that was not the case. Okay, now, no matter how much I wish my house was worth what I paid for it, it's not. So I have what I have. And so now I've lowered the price and gotten, you know, I'm, I'm at market and been realistic. Ultimately, we can't go backwards. You know, there, there's probably um, the, 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 the person who wrote this question, they probably are saying, says, I wish I would have done this with my money instead of what I did do. Um, I bet there's not a person in this room who doesn't have things that they've done throughout their life that if you had to do it over again, you'd do it differently. Okay? Um, we can't change the past. What you can do is make the future better. You don't wait for whatever you had to get back to even because your investments don't have any memory of what you paid for them. Okay? It's worth what it's worth. My house in, in Las Vegas does not have a memory of how much I paid for it. It's worth what it's worth. Okay, now the question is, what do you do? Let's make the best of what you have. And so um, you don't pretend, you don't stick your head in the sand and ignore it. You don't hope and wish that it gets better. But rather, what you do is, you know, come see us, come see some other really qualified investment advisor. You make a plan and you make the best of what you got. So one of these folks said, maybe now is not the time to sit and be patient and wait for something to happen with the investments you already have. No. You need to, Why, you need I to mean, act. See, that, and that's what ha that, um, Emily, this is a common psychological thing. I get this all the time. People go, okay, well, I got this thing, and I paid 10000 for it, and then it went down to 6000 and now it's back to um, 8800 and when it gets back to 10 and I hate it I hate this this is the worst investment I ever made when it gets back to when I get back to even then I'm going to sell it and I'm going to get something really good okay well that's ridiculous what you, it's worth 8800 okay you have $8,800 you don't have, your investment doesn't remember that you paid 10 for it you have 8800 let's make the best out of what we have you know you can't um, we only have so many days ahead of us Right? So let's make the best of what we have and, and make that, that go. Okay. Well, then here's a question that's kind of timely. This person says, I've inherited bonds from parents that are 30-year bonds, but they're not maturing for another 8 or 10 years. So Eek. should I hold them or should I cash them and reinvest? Um, I cannot answer their specific investment question. Okay. Okay. But, what I will, but I'll, I'll give you um, the concept, and that is um, you better, you know who you are, I'm You're trying out to, there. I'm trying to use my ESP powers. To, um, what you better do is you better sit down with somebody and have them run the math for you. And look at what the credit... And when you inherit things, here's another thing. When people inherit money, you know, oh, um, they'll, they'll come in there. I, got, um, I own Lincoln National, and I own um, Manitowoc Crane, and... 
And well, why do you own those stocks? Well, here's the thing. My grandpa worked at Manitowoc, and um, he left the money to my, to my mom, and then she left the stock to me. And I'm like, well, if you, had, if you won the lottery today and you had brand new cash, would you go out and buy Manitowoc Crane? No. Well, then why are you still holding it? Okay, just because it was right for somebody that you loved and was nice enough to leave you this doesn't mean it's right for you. When you inherit something, consider it as cash. Okay, now the question is, if you had that money and it was just cash, would you buy those same things again? Um, somebody needs to help them go through the analysis to decide whether they should sell those now or whether they should um, uh, keep them. Um, and it's, it's a relatively, for a bright investment advisor, relatively simple process, but they need to do that. Okay. Well, there are a lot of emotional questions this evening. Yeah. And this is another one that there's a lot of fear out there. This one is about how can you detect whether or not an investor is operating a Ponzi scheme? Hmm. Um, there are some things you can do. Um, I am very ashamed to say, I, I am truly ashamed to say, there are a lot of, and this is kind of a technical investment term, scumbags in my industry. Um, some really nasty people, and that, I mean, oh, here's the Bernie Madoff, all right? Okay, that, that's where this whole thing, like, these ponds, he, he came to life. 50, and then, I love how, um, yeah, um, the Congress is going to have hearings about Bernie Madoff. So Bernie Madoff still makes $50 billion disappear. Congress makes $150 trillion disappear. And these are the guys going to investigate him? Yeah. <laughs> right on. Um, <laughs> But, Are you sure you and Glenn Beck don't hang out together? Pardon me? I, I, I missed You that. and Glenn Beck. Yeah. Yeah. No. Just um, kidding. I'm just kidding. I just find it ironic, and I do have, um, um, I, I do think when we had the midterm elections later this year that we're going to, I think there's a ground squall in this country of people who are like, whether Republican, Democrat, liberal, like, we got to do something about how much money these people are spending, right? And I think that they're, you know, hopefully we're going to get some, what I'm concerned about is I think that you will get some people in um, that will um, idealistically say, we're going to bring spending, we're going to control spending. The problem is that you get sucked into the system. Um, and and I work, you know, how it turns out, I don't know. But the question was... How do you detect a Ponzi scheme? How do you detect a Ponzi scheme? Okay, here's the thing. Um, one of the, there are things you can do to protect yourself. Number one... Um, one of the things that allowed Madoff to uh, make away with $50 billion of his client's money was that Madoff custodied the money. Okay, so in other words, when you had an account with Madoff, it was, you made the check out to Madoff Securities. Okay, so for example, with my business, the Mutual Fund Store, since I started the company in 1996, we have, um, our client assets have been held by Schwab Institutional, which is a division of Charles Schwab and Company that works with investment managers like us. And I set up that relationship as a firewall between us and our client's money. Our, cli we, our clients give us the authority to buy and sell things in their account, but we can't ever touch the money because it's held at Schwab. I can't, I can't, I, even if I wanted to have a Ponzi scheme, I couldn't because I, the money is held. You should never have your money someplace where the advisor is custodying the money. It's just, it's, it's probably okay, but it creates a potential for something bad to happen. Number two, if it's too good, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Okay? I mean, Bernie Madoff, and, and I just use him as an example because he's like the poster child for Ponzi schemes, but he promised people returns of 2% a month every month forever. When the markets were good, he got 2%. When the markets were bad, he got 2%. 2%, 2%, 2%. I'm sorry, I have, there is no such investment that is so consistent and returns 24% a year. Doesn't happen. And, and the people that are in it, they're like, this is fantastic. He's paying, I'm getting my money. Well, that's because you know, we, we know what, what happened. If it seems too good to be true. so. Number one, make sure that there's a firewall between you and your, your money and your advisor. Number two, 
you know, if what they see, what they're telling you sounds reasonable, everybody's looking for the next, look, if there is no magic investment. You know what I want, what I want, what you want, what everybody in this room wants is that investment that when the market goes up, on up days it participates and on down days you get zero. Isn't that awesome? It only goes up. It's the magic, the Harry Potter investment. Um, <laughs> it does not exist. This is a two-part question. One is, talk a little bit about what the oil spill in the Gulf is going to do to the economy. The other part of the question is, would you sell BP right now or would you hang on to it? <laughs> okay. Um, let me take care of the second one, the second part first. And that is, um, I do not follow individual stocks. Um, so I can't make a judgment on the price of BP stock. Um, I can, however, say that, I mean, my gosh, how can these people come out of that hole? I mean, it can't be good. Now, maybe that's already pricing this. That's what's, I, I, that would have been funny. Um, probably like, um, not really. Um, so I don't, I don't know if the stock price already reflects it, but I will say that, um, I mean, clearly, if you had, all the things in the world that you can invest in, maybe holding on to the stock of a company that lied about how much oil was coming out, that they can't plug the hole, they, I, I have to believe that there are, I mean, yeah, it's on the news every night, so that makes it a salacious, interesting investment, but I have to believe there could be better opportunities than that company, that, that's all I would say. Um, as far as the economy, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, it could have a profound, it will have a profound effect on our number of industries. Um, fish, shrimp. Shrimp are going to get really expensive. Um, and what we don't know now is um, what is going to happen this late summer and fall when hurricane season starts. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden you got hurricanes. See, because right now everything's like hunky dory and you know, there's all that oil and they can kind of halfway control it. And I mean, it's a mess, but um, and you get, you know, along comes the hurricane and picks up the oil like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz and drops it off someplace else. I, I don't know, but um, I can't say that it's going to be good for the economy, but I don't think it's a deal breaker. I don't think it's a deal changer. That I will say. It's not, the oil spill is not the thing that would break our economy. Is Obama going to be successful getting rid of Wall Street? <laughs> How much more time do we have? Not very long. Um, what I will say is that um, um, this has definitely been an administration that has been um, anti-Wall Street. They have, um, and I mean, what is Wall Street? Okay, I don't, I don't know, you know, what, what do we mean when we say Wall Street? I, I do believe that this is an administration that um, believes that um, some people make too much money. No matter how, how hard they work, that, you know, that there's, well, this is too much. And it's, nobody should make that much no matter what they do. Um, and, it, and they have become confiscatory. Um, you know, when, when you talk about, you know, next year, the, t the top marginal tax rate goes from 35% this year to 39.6% next year. And then in 2013, we get a 3.8% surcharge for, to pay for the health care plan. Um, and Medicaid rates are going to go up. And the states are going to raise that. I mean, um, it's getting to the point, I mean, I will tell you, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a little out of school, but uh, th here's a discussion. Um, Chris brought us, the gentleman over here is president of the mutual fund store. He, he is my number two. He runs the company. Okay. I'm the CEO. I'm the, the, the uh, guiding light. He, he actually runs the company. Here's a discussion we've had. Um, next year, or in 2013, I will be... Um, with federal, state surcharges, Medicaid, 
FICA, I will be in pretty darn close to a 60% tax bracket. Okay, now, since I started the mutual fund store in 1996, um, we have, between our company stores and our franchise stores, um, we have put more than 300 people to work, maybe 400 people to work. Okay? Now, here's the thing. I did that because I like what I was doing and we were having fun. But now, all of a sudden, I go, all right, Chris, and, and we're thinking, you know, should we continue to expand? What do we do? Well, here's the thing. If I take my hard-earned capital that I've worked all these years to, to earn, and I keep putting it into the business because we want to grow, and everything goes perfect the way that we put, we have our business plan and everything goes the way I planned, I get 40% of the upside. If something bad happens or we don't execute well or whatever, I get 100% of the downside. So now I'm like, how much, and I'm not going to, we haven't made decisions yet, but I'm starting to go, well, is it worth it for me to put money out and hire more people and grow when I get 40% of the upside, I get 100% of the downside. Um, so that's the problem. It's not just that this administration has picked on Wall Street, which they, and, and, and it has been an administration that has been very um, populist. You, know, the, you guys are good, these people, ooh, these people are evil, bad. Um, I think that that's gonna, I, 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 pendulum usually swings too far this way politically and too far this way and then we'll return in the middle and it'll be cool. Okay. Well, thank you, Adam Bold. Does I finish on that? Well, we have another a few words that Norman would like to add to end our program. Ah. But we want to say thank you very much for everything that you've said tonight. We really appreciate that you're back with us. And I'm going to take the mic to Norm now. You want me to do it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hang on, I'm, uh, hang on, Norm. I'm bringing this to you. Okay. Folks, well, I don't know if you... Wait, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Norm Polsky. There you go, my friend. This was a classic, and I think we ought to stand up and give him a real ovation. Also... The book that he's written was the book I was wanted to write, but <laughs> he did such a good job, and for uh, $10, $10, you won't remember what he told you. Uh, you'll lose 75% by tomorrow morning. You'll lose 100% in two days. If you want to, there are two things you've got to pass on to your family, health and Financial independence. That book is something that can be read, but the only problem is we only have 77 books. So first come, first serve. So go try to buy the books, okay? And thank you for coming.